So what are current interest rates on adjustable rate mortgages? You like 5%? It's probably a little bit high, but it makes the math easier. Let's say an adjustable rate mortgage uh, is running about 5% interest now. How about interest rate on a credit card? 18? I'm going to say 15, again, to make the math easy, because uh, that enables me to ask you, how come both these guys are supplying the same product? They're giving you a dollar and letting you hold it for a year. How come this guy charges you three times as much for that service? Unsecured. Is unsecured. The, second, the credit card guy is unsecured. What difference does that make? Collateral. There is a lack of collateral. Um, secured debt has less risk of a complete loss. That's the easier one. Does anybody ever default on a mortgage? I can, I can remember when people used to say, oh, no, that never happens. But then we had the, uh, the subprime uh, boom of 07 and 09, and there were lots of uh, uh, foreclosures. But even in that instance, even if the property was 20 30% higher in value than it should have been, even if there was a bankruptcy, even if there was a default, those lenders still ended up getting 60, 70, 75 cents on the dollar. I would respectfully submit to you that that's a whole lot different than getting nothing. What happened to the credit card lender in the same instance? When that same homeowner went bankrupt, they got nothing, right? They took a complete loss. So secured debt has much less chance of a complete loss. But what I'd like you to uh, really focus on, because it's not as obvious uh, to a lot of people, is there's also just less risk of default as a secured creditor. What is the first check that mom and dad are going to write every month? What are they going to make sure is paid? The mortgage. It's their greatest asset is one thing. It's a very important to them. And number two, they know that lender can enforce payment. They know if they don't make that payment, they're going to need to find a place to live. And they're going to lose thousands of dollars. Um, so they're going to pay that thing. What is the last debt mom and dad pay uh, each month? And I, I'm always, I always suck people into that because some people are usually saying credit cards. It's right there on the screen. But uh, that's actually not the correct answer. The what? Student loans is an excellent example. I think an even better example is your doctor. At least uh, with me, I, maybe, maybe most doctors are different. I've gone to the same doctor for, I think, close to 30 years, more than 25. Great guy. I mean, I want him to take good care of me. Uh, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure he gets paid. But it's the last check I'm going to write every month because he never even made me sign a credit agreement. He cannot make me pay a penalty. He cannot make me pay a late charge. He cannot raise a, my interest rate to 18%. Whereas the credit card guy, I'm going to pay that on time because I know those people are heartless. I'm, I'm going to pay a $50 late charge if I don't pay it on time. And they're going to make me pay it. Uh, and, and I'm going to start paying 18%. And I'm one of those people, you know, I just pay it every month. I don't like, I don't want to pay any interest, much less 18%, right? So they have leverage on me. And that's a very important concept as a creditor uh, in, in any business. 
And that's what I mean by the word leverage, whether they can motivate the debtor to pay. Um, and that, that's the significance of contract terms. To jump ahead, most of y'all probably already have this. The issue of security, whether you're a secured creditor or not, <clears throat> is the difference of whether you have mechanics lien rights or not, whether you have payment bond rights or not. In this industry, you have the advantage, most business people have to get voluntary security interests. I'm not going to lend you money unless you give me a mortgage on the house you're buying. I'm not going to lend you money unless you give me a lien on the bulldozer you want to buy. Those are examples of consensual security agreements. You have the advantage most of the time of having security in the real estate where you supply labor and materials or security in the form of a guarantee from an insurance company, that's what a bond is, a guarantee that you will be paid. And what we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about today is the importance of recognizing that uh, going in. That's something you need to know, or need to have some feel for before you lend money. I don't, I think you need to evaluate that before you can bid on a project. How do you know whether to charge 5% or 15% on your risk of default and the carrying costs of the money if you have no idea whether you're a secured creditor or not? To put the same thing a different way, if you can determine this project is bonded, or you can determine that you've got strong mechanics lien rights, you can bid that project more aggressively without impacting your profit because your risk of default is lower and your risk of a complete loss is lower. So that, that's one of my big mantras and one of the, really the main reason I'm glad you're here. People tend to think about lien and bond rights is something you deal with once a problem occurs. Uh, the, the customer didn't pay, they're now 90% past due, what do we do about that? And it is important to understand that. But I, what I would like to really encourage you to do is think about that going in, evaluating each project before you decide whether to send $100,000 worth of labor and materials there. Evaluate each project for the strength of your security rights. Part of the reason for that is that it, it, as we'll discuss mostly this afternoon, it's extremely important to collect information in the early stages of the project. Once when you're friends and you have the ability to uh, suggest to your debtor that if they can c help you collect information about the payment bond on the project, uh, then um, you'll be able to get them better pricing uh, on this project, which is an absolutely true story. Um, and, and it really is a partnership rather than an adversarial uh, situation. To put the same thing another way, I tell my material supplier clients, they, they want to develop a partnership relationship with their customers, the subs. Your customer, the subcontractor, wants to know just as badly as the supplier does whether you're a secured creditor or an unsecured creditor on this project. Um, and, uh, if, and I encourage my subcontractor clients to help to, to use their uh, suppliers, credit managers as, as tools to help them evaluate security rights. Uh, and as a partnership, you can both avoid uh, defaults and losses uh, in that manner. Okay, so what if the rate for all lending was uh, changed to 
it's downright un-American to say that if you own a, a house, you can borrow money at 5%, but if you don't own a house, you got to pay 15%. That's un-American. We're going to pass a law that says that all lending has to be at 10%, whether it's uh, secured or not. Who's going to like that and who ain't going to like it? They're going to like it just fine. In fact, it was probably their lobbyists that were in Congress talking about the American way. Uh, now they can double what they charge for lending money, and their risk has not increased. What's that going to do to the unsecured lender? Go put them out of business. Believe it or not, they need 15 or 18 percent because they have such a risk of taking a complete loss. It happens all the time. It's just part of their business, and it's costly, a costly part of their business. Uh, if they could only charge 10 percent, they'd go out of business. All right? What if the rate of all lending was 0 percent? Nobody lend money? You do it every day. Welcome to your world. That's the rate you charge. You ship labor and materials out the door. If you get paid within 30 days at that interest rate, you're thrilled. If you get paid within 60 days and get 0% interest, you're more than satisfied, and so is your boss. If a customer calls you that's 120 days late and says, I tell you what, I'll write you a check right now for the principal amount if you write off all uh, interest and legal fees, what are you going to say? You're probably going to take it. And you're going to sleep better that night than you did the few nights prior to that. That's your world. That's the rate you lend money at. So who's going to get hurt more? under that scenario. It's, it's just like the 10 percent. The, the unsecured creditor is going to get hurt a lot worse than the secured creditor. So again, uh, really the main point of what we're doing today is help you uh, just have an awareness going into projects when you're considering which projects to lend. Uh, to evaluate whether you are a secured creditor or unsecured. Okay, the last time you bought uh, a house, you signed two sheets of paper. One was the promissory note. That was the sheet of paper that said, if uh, you give me $100,000 today, I will pay you $1,000 a month for the next 30 years. That's a type of contract. That's an unsecured promise to pay. It's signed by the contract debtor. It enables the creditor to sue the contract debtor and obtain a judgment. Uh, and if your contract debtor breaches your contract, you can file suit. There's small claims court. You, they don't even allow lawyers to go in there. You can file suit if I think it's $4,000 limit. You can just file those yourself. Or um, you might need to actually hire a law firm uh, like us if it's uh, above 4000 And sometimes lawsuits are half a million dollars. Sometimes they're $10,000. That's just the way it goes. But you... Uh, if the debtor breached the contract, a judge will give you a judgment. The judgment entitles you to the aid of the courts. The whole, if you think about the word judgment, there has been a judgment by the court that you are in fact owed this money. Before that, it was a dispute. You know, nobody knew for sure who owed who, but now there is a judgment. This debtor owes this creditor money. You have the aid of the court to garnish bank accounts, 
to levy on their equipment, garnish their accounts receivable, which we won't really talk about today, but that's chapter 17, which you should look at if, if you need a better understanding or uh, give us a call, we'd be happy to help you. All right, that's unsecured debt. But the last time you bought a house, you signed another sheet of paper. This sheet of paper described a particular asset, a particular property. In this instance, it, it described the real estate where your house was sitting. But it could describe a bulldozer that's sitting out in the parking lot. It could describe uh, an account receivable owed to you by a GC or an owner for a project you did a couple months ago. Some, the security agreement describes some sort of asset and gives the, uh, signed by the property owner, it gives the creditor a lien on that asset. And to keep things simple, we'll stick with the mortgage in the meanwhile. It's signed by the property owner, who in this example is usually going to be the same person as the contract debtor. Uh, but in your business, your construction business, it's not necessarily the property owner may be different than your contract debtor. But it, uh, in the case of a mortgage, uh, the property owner signs it. And it says that if, if I do not keep my agreement as a contract debtor, then you can sell this asset on the courthouse steps and you get all of the proceeds of that sale until you've been paid in full. That's what a lien gets you. That's what being a secured creditor means. You have two avenues to collect your debt. You can sue the contract debtor, get a judgment, and attempt to enforce that judgment, or you can foreclose upon the asset in which you have a lien uh, and, and you get the, pro, the proceeds, or you can do both, uh, which you will probably do if you are able, if you have both of those rights. Okay, so the contracts that you sign every day, or whether you sign them or not, the contracts you are performing every day uh, are just like a promissory note. They're just a little more complicated. A promissory note's simple. Give me a hundred grand, I'll pay you thousand dollars a month. Uh, your contract's a little more complicated. Here's the plans, here's the specifications, here's the schedule. If I perform in accordance with uh, all this spec, you will pay me within 30 days after you, know, you get paid by the owner, whatever it is. They're more complicated, but it's the same in the sense that that uh, is, is an unsecured contract. It gives you rights against the contract debtor uh, if the contract debtor breaches, fa does not keep to the terms of the contract, you can sue them and get a judgment. What is a mechanics lien? It's one of those. Uh, and people are often surprised to learn how similar a mechanics lien and a mortgage are. They, they really are the same. In fact, in both in Maryland and in uh, Virginia, the code provisions you use to foreclose upon a mechanics lien are the same code provisions you use to foreclose upon a mortgage lien. The biggest difference, what's the difference between the two? The biggest difference is that with a mortgage, you're rarely in a dispute about whether the lender has a lien. It's possible, but it's very unusual. The only way that would happen is, you know, forgery, or he wasn't the owner of the property that signed that mortgage, you know. Um, um, and again, m mortgage lenders usually get paid, the, the, or, or get paid most of what they are owed. They, they can have priority issues, which we're gonna talk about uh, this afternoon with mechanics liens. 
if you are a second priority lien, there may not be enough equity in the property for you to get paid. That is what you call a priority issue. The priority of your lien is a problem. Same thing happens with mechanics liens. Um, the biggest difference with a mechanics lien is that you will very commonly end up in arguments about whether you have a lien. Had you, were you still performing work within 90 days before you filed the lien? Was your lien timely filed? Did you correctly identify the owner? Did you correctly describe the property? Um, you're often going to have a big dispute about that. Uh, and, and clients often want to know. That's one reason I like doing these seminars, because if I'm explaining to you, you know, oh, the defense is saying there's all these problems with your mechanics lien, uh, you may be wondering, you know, well, wait, what's going on here? Did Fullerton screw this mechanics lien up? You know, we might, we might file 10 mechanics liens for you. And the phone rings and somebody wants to send you a check. And that's what usually happens. A mechanics lien is your legal right to reach through and get leverage on the owner, you know, and the banks, and everybody pays attention and they pay you. And then on the 11th lien that we file, uh, you get a paper back where they're describing the five or 10 things, five or 10 reasons you don't have mechanics lien rights and your lien is defective. There's no difference in the quality of that lien. I mean, there could be, but uh, often there's no difference. That lien's just as valid as the first 10 or to put the same thing another way, there may have been defects in a, a number of the first liens. But if the owner was holding enough money on the GC and the GC was holding enough money on the sub to just get you paid and take you out, you, you never end up arguing about whether the lien was timely filed, right? If you're arguing, if true mechanics lien litigation where we have to enforce that mechanics lien and you're arguing about whether your lien is valid is because you finally run into a battle between innocents. There are two innocent parties. The, the debtor's usually gone. The contract debtor's usually gone. They're only owed 20 grand on the project and there's three different suppliers who supplied the project who's going to get paid and who isn't. It's a battle between those innocent suppliers, who's going to get the limited fund. Or it's a battle between the innocent GC who supplied the payment bond and, you know, maybe they had a sub who didn't pay their suppliers and that, those suppliers are now making claims against the payment bond. If that GC is holding enough money to get you paid, you're, you're, you, you may have to pay me a few hundred dollars, but you're not, no more than that. If, if you're in litigation for six or nine months, you're trying to make an innocent party bear the loss of, of that contract debtor going, becoming insolvent is what it comes down to. Now, sometimes there's a third thing you can have in your business what we call personal guarantee. They used to be a lot more common. Suppliers used to always get personal guarantees uh, and they always insisted on their credit agreement being signed. And I'm sure they're still doing that with a lot of customers and they're trying to do it on even more. Um, but one choice that you have is to ask your debtor if, if, if you're doing business with anybody whose name ends in Inc. or LLC, that's what you call a limited liability entity. And the whole idea, please, please don't whine and cry to me about how they went out of business, didn't pay your bills, and, and, uh, but now they've opened a new business with a very similar name at the same address with the same phone number. Uh, have you ever seen that happen? It, it, it's going to happen. That's what it means when you're doing business with a limited liability entity. 
Uh, we've had limited liability entities since the days of colonialism and discovery in the 1500s and 1600s. Uh, the, the, the king wanted people to risk a lot of money to build boats and hire people to go explore the world and uh, find new trade markets and establish settlements. That was a very risky business. And people weren't going to do that uh, if, if it might mean that if there was a business failure, if those creditors are going to be able to pursue me for the rest of my life, and, and they're going to put me in debtor's prison, which is what they used to do, uh, I'm not going to risk it. I'm just going to work for somebody else. I'm not going to take a chance. So the whole idea, if you think about it, of the limited liability entity is I can decide, and I've done this many times, I can decide to put $100,000 cash into this new LLC I'm forming. That's a lot of money. I care about that. Uh, and I'm going to work as hard as I can to make sure that business succeeds. But if that business fails, I'm going to kiss it goodbye and walk. And you're not going to get paid. And that's just the way it is. And that's the way we want it. So, of course, one thing that means is you have to have some awareness of whether you're dealing with an individual or a limited liability entity. You also want to have some awareness, uh, you know, the financial strength, whether it's an individual or a limited liability uh, entity. This personal guarantee, now you have a second debtor, a second contract debtor that you're allowed to sue. It has no impact on your mechanics lien rights. It does not, it makes it no more likely you have mechanics lien rights. It makes it no less likely you have mechanics lien rights. It's just a completely different thing. Uh, having a contract can be important for mechanics lien rights, which, which we will get into this afternoon, whether or not you do have to prove that you are owed money under the contract, usually in order to have mechanics lien rights. But that's not true of this second contract signed by the second debtor. What this allows you to do, which can be very important, is it allows the creditor to sue the second debtor, but it's another unsecured promise to pay where you end up with a judgment against the second debtor, and then now you can garnish the bank accounts of the second debtor and the first debtor because you got a judgment against both of them, right? And that increases your chances of collecting because people are more likely, if they have a limited liability entity as a contract debtor, uh, the owner may not even bother to pay a bankruptcy filing fee. They just close the LLC and then open a new business. But as an individual, the owner of that company, the president of the company, uh, can't do that. Their only choice is to file bankruptcy to get a clean bill of health, which they may do. But if there's not that many creditors and he, they have enough money, they may pay the three creditors who have personal guarantees. The, uh, the creditors that do not have personal guarantees will not collect anything. That's the significance of a personal guarantee. But the personal guarantor can also file bankruptcy and then you end up the same place with both of those unsecured contracts. And now it's all about whether you have security of some type. But the punchline for the purposes of this introduction is this enables us to give you an introduction to payment bonds. That's what a payment bond is, is a contract with a second debtor. It's conceptually the same as a personal guarantee. The difference is rather than the a individual guarantee from the president of the company, 
Uh, it is hopefully a big insurance company that signed the payment bond. And if it is traveler, traveler's casualty or something like that, you have a pretty high assurance of getting paid. However, uh, the bonding company can go out of business. It is possible. And if it's a smaller bonding company that you've never heard of, there's a greater risk of that which again, this is an introduction jumping ahead to what we, the very last thing we'll do today is talk about payment bonds. You have to be able to evaluate the strength of the bonding company on this project, uh, which is easy to do, but it, that can be important. 